um, uh, for giving me your attention um, this late Sorry. in the day. Are you okay with the live stream? Yes, absolutely, that is fine. And I really want to thank the Radfam Collective for having me. I know I was a really last minute addition. Um, so thank you so much today. Well, first a little bit about myself. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I, currently I live in Glasgow, Scotland, and I'm doing my PhD there at the Glasgow School of Art on Second Wave Feminism. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, what happened when we opened a, the Vancouver Women's Library. This was a um, generative project as we didn't merely want to react to the world, but we wanted to create our own world. What motivated us to start this library in the first place was a shared belief that women's writing is revolutionary, that feminist political theory can remake the world, and that it profoundly matters to preserve and record women's history. This idea is not new. In fact, this project was an homage of sorts to the unique historical relationship between women, books, and publishing. We intentionally continued the second wave tradition of building a feminist movement through women-controlled communication and knowledge circuits in order to prepare other women in the larger community for action and to share strategies for altering the larger public. Feminist print culture historian Trish Travis argues that the surge in women's presses during the 70s and 80s was an attempt by a group of allied practitioners to create an alternative communication circuit, a women-centered network of readers and writers, editors, printers, publishers, distributors, and retailers through whom ideas, objects, and practices flowed in a continuous dynamic loop. Women's presses, bookstores, and libraries were not intended to exist as isolated institutions, but to facilitate a dialogue of knowledge and production amongst a larger network of women. As we know, this cannot prevail within the already existing male structures of communication. The overarching concern amongst the dominant majority of book women was to facilitate a communications network free from patriarchal and capitalist control. Literary critic Elaine Showalter argues that the work of feminist criticism, which she terms gynocriticism, begins at the point where we free ourselves from the linear absolutes of male literary history, stop trying to fit women between the lines of the male tradition, and focus instead on the newly visible world of female culture. Resistance to male-dominated modes of production was the raison d'etre of most women's publishing and readerships during the second wave. Writer, publisher, and feminist scholar Ritu Menon argues that feminist publishing, almost without exception and everywhere in the world, came about as a consequence of the women's movement and acted in solidarity with it. She highlights that despite increased visibility of women's writing today, such as memoirs and autobiographies of female celebrities and politicians, or the pop culture uptake of Margaret Atwood, feminist publishing as a whole has regressed into conflicting modes of production. She says that commercial publishing is interested in movement as market, not movement as resistance. Second wave feminists laid the foundation for a feminist readership of women where there previously only existed isolated nodes. Deliberate calls for a networked movement happened through the strategy of print and publishing. In the UK, as many of you will know, this manifested in notable publications such as the periodical Wires, which stood for Women's Information and Referral Inquiry Service, which was set up as an information directory of radical women's organizations, newsletters, academics, activists, books, and presses. The well-known second wave feminist outcry, the personal is political, was the underlying philosophy central to making women's worlds public through the writing and publishing of books, magazines, and periodicals, and through the organizations that enabled their distribution. <coughs> Feminist print culture of the second wave engendered an infrastructure of a decentralized collectivity, leading to a network of women's presses, publications, bookstores, and libraries. Such an infrastructure allowed women to find each other through reading and writing, and despite their differences, acknowledging what unites them and supporting a shared vision for a feminist future. Similar to the origins of the women in print movement, a growing urge 
of for information sharing for information sharing amongst women is surfacing today as a way of responding to the lack of understanding the common denominator of the feminist struggle. This growing interest became apparent when the idea of the Vancouver Women's Library began to resonate with other women. Our group grew and the library received international interests, including requests from women who had heard about the project of a women's library and wanted to start their own localized chapters. For several months before the Vancouver Women's Library was launched, the space was my personal weaving studio as um, I lead a, se a, a secret life as a textile artist. Um, it was situated within a larger gallery and grouping of independent artist studios, and as you can see, it was an extremely tiny space of about uh, 100 square feet. We opened our doors in February 2017 with a collection of around 80 books written by women from our own personal bookshelves. During the first hour of opening, we were overwhelmed by the attendance of women who wanted to sign up and start borrowing books. Then, <laughs> without warning, we were then met with fierce, persistent, and violent protests by a group of about two dozen trans activists who did not see themselves represented in the project. I should say that in this um, screenshot from a video, not everyone in this is a protester. Just letting you know. Um, this group was loosely organized under the acronym GAG, GAG, which stands for Gays Against Gentrification. <laughs> Protesters were stationed outside the entrance, preventing women from entering the library on a sub-zero winter night, and eventually made their way inside, carrying signs and shouting slogans such as no turfs, no swerfs. They distributed an open letter while they were inside, which claimed that the Vancouver Women's Library is complicit in the deaths of trans women and detailed a list of demands to be followed by us, central to which was the removal of the following list of 20 books from our original catalog. The banned books include the usual feminist culprits or bad women on this list who dare to write about political theory, such as Catherine McKinnon, Mary Daly, Sheila Jeffries, Andrea Dworkin, and Janice Raymond. But there were also bizarre mentions of sci-fi, mindfulness and Buddhism, and self-help. We had a suggestion function on our website which could be used to anonymously submit titles for future ordering, and which was active before the protest but it had not been used by the time the open letter was circulated. GAG did state that we are currently compiling a comprehensive list of suggestions that we will share, but then they added that this would only happen when the other demands are met. Those demands included the stepping down of my second co-founder and a restructuring of the Vancouver Women's Library's board of directors, which did not exist. <laughs> it's as though grassroots feminist Organization by young women is inconceivable. Everything, you know, has to be corporatized. This should indicate to the careful observer that those who wrote the open letter had no factual understanding of how we were structured previous to the protest. The list of suggestions for books to include were never received, presumably because we didn't bow down to their demands. They doubled down with the further claim that the Vancouver Women's Library enacts violence on sex workers by working to deny their access to resources and support. They work alongside the colonial government to pass bills that do direct violence to sex workers, such as Bill C-36. Uh, we're still talking about a women's library, by the way. <laughs> Bill C-36 was introduced as a law in 2014, three years before the Vancouver Women's Library is opened. And the bill supposedly criminalizes the purchase of sexual services in Canada, but the ways the Canadian government has enacted this bill is virtually non-existent. The Canadian government does, of course, facilitate violence against women in the sex trade, but the protesters couldn't seem to grasp that this violence had nothing to do with a free volunteer-run women's library. <laughs> it seems a complete non sequitur to accuse a free independent library with a meager initial collection of 80 books of enacting violence against sex workers when what we really did was provide literature on the empirical frontline evidence suggesting that men who buy sexual 
who buy sex cause the demand for women to experience sexual violence on a daily basis. A further claim by GAG was that organizers refuse public conversations, won't engage with those who are directly impacted, and refuse to speak to the violence they have enacted with the library and organizing outside of it. Why don't we take a quick look at how they decided to engage with us. Now, if you don't hear this, I don't think there's a sound, but it doesn't really matter. Um, Okay, so if you couldn't hear that, it was basically um, uh, featuring a man who identifies as a woman um, ripping down um, a poster of the Scum Manifesto by Valerie Solanas. Um, and uh, this video, I think, init initially was about 20 minutes, so that's just one little excerpt of it. Um, again, not everyone featured in this shot is a protester. Um, in covering this protest, Megan Murphy and Feminist Current brilliantly helped bring the issue into public consciousness, but she was unsurprisingly accused of dead naming and misgendering the man who tore down the poster of Valerie Solana's Scum Manifesto. <laughs> Protesters also poured red wine on books they disagreed with. Oh, this is Janice Raymond, a Janice Raymond book. They smoked inside, they pulled the fire alarm, incurring fines, and stole wine from our makeshift bar. Shortly after the initial protest, the outside of the space was spray painted overnight with the slogans Class War, No Turfs, No Swerfs, and This Space Hates Women. Gag did not comment on the graffiti, they neither took responsibility nor did they condemn it. The Vancouver Women's Library explicitly stated in our original mandate that we welcome all women regardless of creed, class, gender, and by gender we mean gender in its original sense, gender expression, you know, race or sexuality. Um, however, Gag stated that this language is used by cis women as a move to innocence from their complicity in violence against trans women. It is used to mark trans women as other and center themselves again as victims of patriarchy. <laughs> I actually agree with them. <laughs> so because this talk is called Lessons, um, I'll end this talk with a few personal lessons from this experience. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Far too often these protests and open letters are not meant to achieve anything progressive, but to frame a conflict of opinion as an abuse of power and thus shutting down any form of debate. This kind of pushback against women's spaces is strengthened by a growing uptake in pop culture of social justice rhetoric, creating immense guilt and pressure for isolated young women who are not allowed to center their own experiences. Demanding that certain books be banned from our collection also introduces some questions. As women, and particularly as young feminists, we should ask ourselves, is it important to me to learn as much as I can from the women who started this movement? Am I going to accept that the idea that traditional male philosophers such as Plato, Nietzsche, and Freud can be read critically while feminist philosophers are deemed outdated and irrelevant and even violent? Is institutional and... Is institutional and cultural commitment to neutrality, equality, and free speech enough to achieve women's liberation? Supposedly all sides deserve to be heard equally, while staying neutral has become a sought-after characteristic for public bodies and politicians, especially libraries. I don't think that this is useful for women, because as feminists well know, neutrality is just another word for the male status quo. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Ask
Asking for free speech and centralized corporate communication circuits is tricky, as free speech was never meant to include the revolutionary speech of women in the first place. I believe that as feminists, we carry a responsibility to center ourselves in our own struggle, to be creative in the ways we organize and communicate with each other, to be unapologetically woman-centered, and to take advantage of the absolute luxury of being able to look back at political networking strategy and experimentation that second-wave feminists left for us. We must situate ourselves as continuing, not reinventing, the larger historical project of women's liberation. I'll leave you with a quote from a member of the library who wrote in response to the question, why do you need a women's library? For all the young women, all our daughters, who don't even know what they're losing, who don't even know their own history, they are coming of age and their rage is growing. I hear their feet, they're coming. Thank you.